Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Leadership in Politics with Dr. Abraham on the show with me today is author Ken Pasternak. Ken, welcome again. Welcome to Leadership in Politics. It's a great pleasure to be with you again, Dr. Abe. I'm glad you came and this is your second time on the show. We have some good news to share with the audience. You have a new book, Exploding Turkeys and Spare Trousers, Adventures in Global Business. Thank you for sending it to me. It was a pleasure being part of it by endorsing it. And I'm having you on here. I'm also endorsing it again. So where did the idea come from? Well, Dr. Abe, I'm very privileged and honored to be part of something called 100 Coaches, a movement that was started by Marshall Goldsmith. We met about three years ago in London, a group from Europe with Marshall. And then a year later, which is about 15, 16 months ago, a small group from 100 Coaches met in London. The group is made up of coaches and influencers and, and other change agents, if you will, uh, from the UK, Switzerland, Russia, India. I came down from Finland. And during our discussions, we tried to find ways that we can make an influence on thought and ideas. And one idea was to come up with the, each of us would post on LinkedIn something once a week during one hour, eight o'clock London time in the morning. We would support each other. We would learn from each other. We would comment on each other. In fact, we began to call it the hour of learning power because it became very, very uh, popular and very, very uh, in, in depth and understanding of leadership change, all kinds of issues, and coaching, of course. Uh, my problem was I wanted to be a part of this group, but I didn't know what to write about. So I came home from that meeting, and I actually said to my daughter, who's, of course, much more facile and active on social media than I was at the time, what should I do? And she said, Dad, you've always been telling stories. You've been using them in your classes, with your clients, and speaking engagements. And your stories always have some purpose to what you're talking about. They emphasize some element of communication or leadership or teamwork. Why don't you write some of these stories from your experiences? And that's how I got into it and uh, have been continuing to do that. I'm glad actually we're lucky that you put this in writing through you started with your group, but for you to be able to bring it to a larger audience and let them go through and delve into these meaningful stories. So we thank you and we thank your daughter for the, for the suggestion. That's an excellent suggestion. And thank you for putting it in the book. As I told you, I went through the book. I went through the stories. They're insightful. They're informative. There's a lesson. There's a story behind the story. So it's, it's wonderful to know. Why did you choose this short story format? Why short stories? What does it mean to you that you write mm -hmm. short stories? Well, it's actually a function of LinkedIn because I was a novice, I did not know when I started to write these that LinkedIn only allowed you to write a story of 1300 characters, sure. no more. Of course, you can write an article, but I wasn't looking to write articles. I wanted to do short, quick stories. And it, in the beginning, it was a frustration and it was a constraint. But after a while, it really helped me hone my language down to the precise words that I needed to say and I would typically write one of these stories, two or 3,000 characters, and then edit and edit and edit to get it down to 1,300. Uh, so that was the genesis for the short story format. But at the same time, as I got more involved in social media, I began to see how people are actually trying to be concise and short. Most readers don't have the time or energy to read long pieces. And I find to, in today's environment, short stories allow people to, to get the information, get the idea quickly, and then they can move on. So it kind of came together in that way. It's perfect, especially the way you write them, they're meaningful. Thank you. They're, they're short, but they're meaningful and insightful. So thank you for that. So what years and countries do the, story, the stories in your book cover? Well, because I've had the chance to live in the United States, live in London, live in Paris, live in Istanbul, live in Brussels, live in Finland, uh, I found over the years that I've collected these funny incidents or learning incidents. Uh, so the stories start 
from my years working for Citibank in New York City. And uh, then they progressed from there. I worked with Citibank for 18 years in New York and London and Helsinki and Brussels and Istanbul. And then I moved on and worked uh, in the 1990s with the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, which was set up in 91 to assist the transition of Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union from communist countries into market economies. So I found myself traveling all across Russia and Uzbekistan and all kinds of interesting places. Uh, and then in 96, my wife and I moved back to Finland when I started to do more consulting and speaking and teaching as an independent consultant and set up a couple of consulting businesses. Uh, so some of the stories take place with my traveling to China, to Africa. Uh, so they're, they're spreading from 1970 up until just a few years ago, and they cover the U.S. and they cover Europe and the Middle East and Africa and a bit of Asia. So it's really? quite... Yeah, you're sharing your experience with us. And, you know, that's where the adventures in global business comes yeah. in. Uh, I must say, I was very pleased one of my colleagues decided to name me as the Indiana Jones of cultural adventures. Oh, yeah. I, I haven't started using it too much, but my you publisher should. is very pleased about it. Yeah, You should, because uh, the way the story is formatted and you put them together, it takes the reader into different dimensions. Take them on a journey with you, especially as they immerse into reading the book and they mesmerize with its details. Thank you. Well, it, as our good friend Dave Ulrich has said in his endorsement that you know, it's about those years being a road warrior, which is what he has been all of his career. And he commented that, you know, now when we can't travel like we used to, mm -hmm. well, you can read a book like this and still travel. Yeah, you so travel that, with your book. Kind of what I went for there. And I think yeah. you succeeded. You succeeded in allowing that to happen. Thank you for, uh, for doing that. So let me see what else I prepared for you. Now. That book title is kind of long. Normally we make it short and sweet and, uh, and uh, two or three words, that's enough. But here we have a long title. Uh, where does this book title come from? Tell us. Well, I must give credit to my publisher, Alison Jones, for coming up with this title. Um, I had suggested a rather mundane title and she thought we needed something a bit more quirky to go mm. with the quirkiness of some of the stories. So Exploding Turkeys and Spare Trousers, uh, Adventures in Global Business. The Exploding Turkeys comes from a story that I have in the book about the first Thanksgiving my wife and I had when we lived in Istanbul in 1986, I think it was. And we wanted to have a Thanksgiving party. And uh, we were learning Turkish. We did have someone working with us in the house, a woman by the name of Aisha, who helped us cook and clean a little bit because we were both pretty busy. And uh, Aisha didn't speak English. So when my wife went to the butcher to buy turkey for the Thanksgiving celebration for all these people we were inviting, she did not know the word for turkey. So my wife said, Iki buyuk tavukla which is two big chickens, when she asked the butcher. And we bought those and we brought them home. And on the day of the Thanksgiving party, we put them in the oven and we began to hear popping noises and exploding noises coming from the oven. And it turned out that the butcher, in order to make these chickens larger than they were originally, had injected water under the skin of the turkey, of the chickens. Oh, interesting. And that's what was exploding. Uh, there's a further irony to the story, and I'll leave the uh, public to read the book to find that, but it has to do with the surname of our, our, our assistant, uh, Aisha, uh, which we found very, very funny. So that's exploding turkeys. Spare trousers came from a story I wrote about visiting a restaurant chain headquarters in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. The company was called Friendlies. And anyone who traveled from years in the Northeast of the United States saw these wonderful restaurants for ice cream and milkshakes and hamburgers. Sadly, I believe they've gone into bankruptcy and I'm not sure they've emerged successfully. 
But I pulled up in front of their headquarters to meet the chief financial officer. And I found it to be an old New England wooden house, mm. three stories, met the receptionist downstairs. And she told me I had to climb three flights of stairs to meet the CFO in his office. So I started climbing one flight, two flight. And on the third flight, this at the landing before I went into his office, my trousers split from the waistband right through the underbelly or the crotch of my, so I had to, uh, navigate getting into his office, talking to him, and especially getting out of his office, walking backwards and noticed, uh, yeah. to, uh, to get out of that situation without embarrassing myself, which is why, you know, I always say that you need either spare trousers when you travel or you have to learn to sew yeah. one or the other. Yeah. yeah. So that's where, Ele that's where exploding uh, turkeys and spare trousers come from. I like it. And of course the adventures in the global business is your experience with Citibank and all of the other corporate offices and companies. Yeah, I've been very with. fortunate, Dr. Abe, and, uh, you know, working with corporations, working with governments uh, all around the world. And uh, it's fun to tell these stories. And it's even more useful, I feel, that for each story, I've included a lesson about life or a lesson about business, which I hope can be a takeaway that's useful for the reader if it's fun to read them when you said fun to write it it's also fun to read them fun mm -hmm. to read them and i'm certain your readers our readers and listeners when, when they actually order the book or have the book and they go through these stories they would learn the idea is you provide an insights to them something for them to learn along the way now let me see can you share one or two stories and their lessons sure um you know one of the things that struck me as I was writing these was the word serendipity. Mm. It, it was amazing how I found myself at the right place at the right time, uh, more often than I could have ever imagined. And, uh, it, you know, one story which I think has the most responsive uh, act, uh, reactions on, on social media. I was here in Helsinki. I was walking from my apartment to a meeting at a nearby hotel and a huge rainstorm came and I got drenched. My mm. trousers, my khaki trousers were completely wet. Just before the hotel where I was having this meeting, I saw a secondhand clothing store. Mm. Uh, they're all perfect, over the city. Perfect timing, huh? Yeah. And I thought, well, I have nothing to lose. I went down to the men's department, which was one rack, and I found a pair of khaki trousers in my size. What luck. I didn't even put them on. I grabbed them because I saw the label was my size. Went to the hotel, went to the men's room, changed into the new trousers, had the meeting, came home, the, the rain had stopped, and I walked in the house. And my wife said to me, I thought your trousers would be uh, wetter, given how wet it was, how it was raining when you left. And I told her how lucky I was to go into mm -hmm. this secondhand store. And she looked at me and started laughing. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't understand why. And she, when she could finally talk, she said to me, you're wearing your trousers. Those are the trousers that you donated to the wow. clothing store wow. about three weeks ago. And I took them off right in the hallway. And sure enough, I had actually rebought for 13 euros my old trousers. And what are the chances of that happening? What are the chances? What a story. Yeah. What's the um, lesson here? Tell me, give me, give me a takeaway. What's well, the, takeaway? The, the, the way I phrased it, it's a little bit wordy, but you may not always end up where you thought you were going, but you will always end up where you were meant to be. Meant to be. What, what were you meant to be? And, and I think yeah. I wrote in the story, and sometimes your trousers are also where they're supposed to be as well. Uh, At least in this story, they are. In this story. <laughs> they were. All right, give me another story. Well, here's another one. Uh, I was on a flight. I think it was from Pittsburgh to Charleston, West Virginia. This was okay. back in the 70s. And I sat next to a young guy who was very nervous, and he had a piece of paper in his hand. So I started to talk to him to try to calm him down. And he told me in his hand were his papers to report to duty for his first day mm -hmm. in the Navy. And I knew immediately we had a problem. 
I took out the magazine from the seat in front of me, the back of the seat in front of me, and I showed him on the map that Charleston, West Virginia is a city in a landlocked state. There's no way there could be a naval base in Charleston, West Virginia. In fact, he was supposed to be going to Charleston, South Carolina, wow. where, of course, the U.S. does have a naval base. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, boy, this, this poor kid, he started to sweat, and he was so, so nervous. He couldn't have been more than 18 or the minimum age for, for enlisting. So I called over the air hostess, and she got the captain involved, and they actually got him booked onto a fl flights to get him to Charleston, uh, South Carolina in time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just one of these stories where, again, being in the right place at the right time. At the right time, yeah. And, and not yeah. only this, you're actually being helpful. You could have just knew about it, and you would have said, do whatever you have to do. But you took the initiative to actually guide him. Yeah, well, you know. You've got that's, to. <laughs> that's got you. To. That's you. That's, that, that's me, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that's you. But I needed to ask you, where can people find the book? Is it already on Amazon? What is it? It, it, it is on Amazon for pre-order. It actually gets published on July 6th. Okay. But you can pre-order now either the paperback. That looks like this, by the way. You'll get there your you copy go. soon. It's available in paperback. It's available in Kindle. And I also went to a studio here in Helsinki and recorded, recorded the audio. Oh, nice. In your own voice. In my own voice. And this was a new experience. Is uh, it going to be on Audible, you mean? I'm hoping it will be. Okay. I believe it's available on a few other platforms like uh, Apple. Okay. And my publisher is working uh, with Audible. For, there's some issue there, but hopefully it'll be available on Audible very shortly. That's very sweet. Nice to always see you. Nice to uh, hear the good stories that you always shared with us. And, and especially in this book, thank you for honoring us again with another session. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Dr. Abe. It's a great pleasure to be with you again. Thank you. The most welcome.